Thank you, Russell, for joining us today to talk about all things HR leadership during the COVID-19 ordeal. So as Chief HR Officer for Freneri, which has some of our best brands in terms of P Designs creams, and it'd be great just to hear what, you know, how has this impacted the organisation? The challenge that I would say is our business is because we're in multiple markets across the globe and, you know, every market has experienced this crisis in a different way. You know, in Italy, in our market there, as the world would have seen, it would have been one of the first, let's call it westernised nations to experience the onset of the crisis fairly early, right through to um, New Zealand, who I think as a nation, the experience has been incredibly different. For us, it's been it's been mixed. There's certainly been some consistencies across um, our business. We're largely um, both what, what I would say is a retail uh, channel and an out-of-home channel business, so retail being supermarkets, grocery stores, and out-of-home being, you know, corner milk bars, corner stores, petrol stations. So some of our markets have experienced um, the crisis in a very, very different way. Spain is a really good example. Spain is predominantly an out-of-home market. The increased onset of the virus within the community coupled with the way our business operates means that, you know, that as a market has been impacted more. So then from a HR approach, it has meant that the team there in Spain have had to deal with a more heightened employee uh, experience issue in terms of you know, having to stand down employees, seek government support and the like. Whereas in some of our other markets, we've largely been able to maintain operations, given that we can still manufacture ice cream. You know, what's really, really important in a lot of these instances is the first thing to do is to understand, I think, two things, employee health and wellbeing, care, protection. And then the second one is just the, you know, what I would say is the commercial liquidity of your business. So how do you keep trading? How do you protect the financials of your business? Because you know, if that becomes a, a bigger risk, then it obviously has a manifestation across into your employees as well. And, and what about as a, as a leader of the business, in particular HR, where have you felt most stretched? Our operating model is we have a very, very lean head office uh, and our resources predominantly sit out in our markets. We, we like to use the word glocal for want of a better word if you use the catchphrase. But it's not uncommon for our group team to travel to a country to either transfer learning, help deliver initiatives. So the challenge, I think, from my perspective is there's always the temptation to want to go to a country and help the local you know, country head and the, and the HR team work through their problem. In this case, you can't. So you have to support from afar. You have to work out what do you stop doing because it's just a distraction you know, on the ground, the HR team or the country head have to deal with what they have to deal with. And at a group level, you've got to work out, well, am I imposing something or am I asking something that just is, is a distraction? So are there certain things that you would have paused, certain programs, pieces of work that you've just paused? Absolutely. We've probably done both. We've said, how do we add a layer of support or capability that stops the local team having to duplicate work or stops them having to get distracted from dealing with, you know, talking to unions or talking to employees. So in the early set, what we did was we developed really, really quickly a guidance documentation on how to think about how they might, might respond to a layering build of potential infection rates within in the business or within the community. So at a particular stage, what would the country need to do? How would it need to communicate with employees? At what point in time do we have to completely shut a factory down? Um, or, ha- or more importantly, how can we run a factory where you have people coming from you know, home into the work environment and back home again? Um, so in that case, we, we also quickly developed communication templates, documents, Q&As, which just eased the effort that was required at a local level. And then the second one is, which is I think quite common, in that everyone in markets 
in some instances, HR teams in particular or leadership teams, they're all facing the same question. In a crisis, what tends to happen is people become very insular. They look at what they actually have to deal with. And so it was encouraging our various countries who are all solving the same problem to share their initiatives and learnings really quickly across the business. Is that more so than typically happens? So has there been greater collaboration? I would say two things. One is that if you take what a crisis does in terms of a leadership team, is you very, very quickly localise your focus. It takes a degree of effort to step back from that and think from a broader perspective, just because the very nature of, of, of us as humans is we worry about what's in front of us. So if you're in Egypt, as an example, and you're having to shut a factory, when you're in Russia and you're thinking about the possibility of shutting the factory, the need is to then talk to your cohort in Egypt to say, what did you do? How did you do it? So that you don't repeat the same effort so you can quickly learn. So because we are lean at the corporate level, very little is designed centrally and pushed out. What The way we operate is we leverage best practice across our business because somewhere in our 23 countries, somewhere we have best practice. And so it's quickly picking that up and pushing that across into other markets as quickly as possible. So that's definitely how we responded. And a really good practical example is the concern that it, that occurs in a factory when I'm on a line and I'm standing beside a pier, how do I know that I'm socially distanced? So we did really simple things like you see in the supermarkets today. We put markers on the line on the floor that just measured out the social distancing space. And then we evolve that to put up um, perspex barriers between employees just to protect them. And, and also, I think, to give them a sense of feeling that they were protected as well. Yeah. So where you've been able to continue operating, you have. Yeah. And in some countries, you would have had to pause operations, I suspect. Yeah. What about your direct peers and your, your fellow executives? What have they lent on you for? Look, I think there have been times when a country head has reached out just to sound out their, their thinking about how they might deal with a factory closure. Egypt's a classic example. We had a, uh, an infection confirmed in, in our factory in Egypt. We were very, very fortunate in that our factory operates in an area of Cairo where 80% of the surrounding industry uh, and factories had already closed. But because of our efforts, and our diligence on hygiene and hygiene standards, we've been able to sustain our operations. So in that case, the country head, um, you know, reached out and we had a conversation around how would you manage the evolving scenario? At what point in time would you think have to think about closing the factory? How do you communicate to employees? What do you say? And then if you shut your factory, how do you start to open that back up and and assure employees that it's safe to come in? Uh, not just necessarily peers. There have been individuals probably at lower levels in the organisation where obviously they think about this scenario in a different way and they're concerned about their employer, their employment. So I've had the odd telephone call to say, you know, I've just taken on a mortgage. What, you know, what do I do? How do I think about it? Um, so it's just providing some degree of assurance. You know, in, in most cases, it's just been more for advice or as a sounding board, probably now in the latter stages of where we are. And what about your own team? How have you kept them motivated? I've got an incredibly lean team. Um, there's me and two others at the group level as a corporate organisation. But, but if you think about the extended HR community, it, it's been... I think doing two things, keeping them focused on what their role really should be and having a conversation with them about what their role is, giving them perspective. I think just trying to humanise a degree of the conversation. And then the second part is to keep them focused on the tasks so that they feel like what they're doing is really, really important and it's adding value and it's, you know, it's critical to the business operation. And it's hard to even think about this when we look at, you know, the, the recently released unemployment 
rates. But has there been any upside to this? The positive in this is that I think there's been a couple. There's been a greater degree of cohesion amongst the leadership team in that they've all had to come together and work out how each of them can run their relative you know, functions in and amongst the same scenario. In business, you know, you might have a shutdown in the factory and the factory, the head of the operations is incredibly worried about restarting the factory and, and getting productivity back up and running. But the head of sales might be sitting there saying, well, hang on a minute, you know, I can't meet my customer demand. But in this case, every function is facing the same challenge. And so I, th- I think there's been a benefit in that. It's in its own right been a form of leadership development in that it's enabled leaders to work out how to manage a crisis. But in most of our countries, this is probably the first serious crisis that some of our leadership teams might have experienced. Next time, somewhere in their career, and it's bound to happen, when they face another crisis, they can rely back on this experience. That helps them cope with stress. That helps them um, seek clarity in their decision-making. That helps them assess risk in their decision-making. That helps them understand how to communicate to employees more effectively. So I think there's been some positives there. I would hope that this has provided you know, our general employee population with a degree of perspective in life in what's really, really important and what's, and what's not, either in their own family um, situation or the like. Or well, the simple lifestyle that we've all been leading, you know, most people singing its praises, you know, most people embraced it and almost a bit frightened about going back to, you know, the hectic, frenetic pace that we left behind. Mm. You know, I shared this story with my children the other day. My father grew up in, in as a child in World War II and we were, it was over the Easter weekend and we were talking about Easter and my father said to me, you know, Russell, um, I only ever had two eggs a year and they were at Easter and they were boiled eggs and that was the only eggs I ever got for seven years. Yet here we are worrying about, you know, other uh, luxuries in life. You can take that, hopefully take that back in and then you can look at, well, what is the business really there for and, and what do I expect the company to do for me versus what do I really have? And I think sometimes people lose a bit of perspective. They get worried about the the luxuries in life or or they try and compare organisation to organisation. And in, and in our case, in some instances, because we've been able to continue to trade, The fact that you actually have employment relative to someone who doesn't right now um, is, I think, valuable in its own right. What about the HR function? You touched on that a bit earlier, Russell. Can you envisage any any changes, you know, in terms of skills or or, um, requirements that HR is going to need to embrace post this? I think this will heighten the commercial focus, I hope. Clearly, when you're in a situation like this and one of the things you look at is spend on initiatives, what you quickly start to do is to say, well, is there a return on the investment that I'm making? And am I pursuing an initiative because it's the fashionable thing to do versus does it really have a commercial benefit to my organisation? I'll give you a really good example. I sat on a call several weeks ago about engagement surveys and one of the questions was that was posed to the community was how do we think about engagement surveys in this environment and everyone was talking about the types of questions they should ask in their survey and the like this is a HR community so the question I said was let's take a step back you are all thinking about the types of questions you want to ask employees in the engagement survey I said but your senior executives right and this is it early onset of the the crisis. Your senior executives are thinking about cash preservation, they're thinking about liquidity, they're thinking about the commercial viability of their organisation. The last thing they're going to be thinking about is what question they ask in a survey. What you need to do is you need to think about how does your survey add value to the problem at hand of the senior executives and could you use that tool in a very, very different way? So rather than asking a question about how does an employee feel, maybe you can ask questions around 
what are some of the things that the business could explore to protect itself. I think the other one is around probably true generalisation. In some organisations, we've pursued specialisation in our HR functions. But down at the operational level, when you have a HR team that you know, are on site, I think what this has brought about is the need to build more generalist capability, mm. either industrial relations, health and safety, rather than you rely on a specialist. What about you personally, professionally? What do you, will you do anything differently coming out of this? Or are you looking forward to doing something in particular? That last point that I made about the commercial capability of the HR function, it's pushing that probably even more in our organisation. And equally, what are they doing now that they should think about stock doing? Because it just doesn't add value. I think the other one is that social responsibility in this environment will be heightened. So it's as an organisation thinking about what does that look like in the future? You know, the community or our customers or our, you know, or our consumers, more importantly, might have a different lens. And what is that and how do we respond to that? Is there anything that you wish in hindsight you had known in advance that might have helped you to manage this differently? I thought about uh, this crisis and, and how I've responded and I've, I've lent back on prior experiences and one of the things that I think I'm incredibly lucky to have experienced is I served in the Army as an officer. Every scenario we managed was a crisis in some form or another. And a lot of what I had been taught, developed, challenged to think about has benefited me in this case. And I think this is the part of, you know, to your point around what could HR do differently. I, I wonder whether or not there's, instead of the shift of or the focus of, you know, leadership development or, you know, development of soft skills, have we spent enough time developing the capability of our leaders to respond in a crisis? In a situation like this, very, very sane people do things that are insane and how someone who can practically or, or pragmatically think about their life very, very quickly develops behaviours that are not practical. And I think that exists in, in business. So as leaders are under the pressure and, and as they're thinking through this, how quickly they, their bias comes to the fore or how quickly they start to think about decision-making in the absence of facts. And it's getting people to sort of take a step back and calmly think through the problem, look at all of the available facts and then make a decision uh, and break it up into a series of issues and responses. And then I think to start to future scenario plan around what could happen and what's our response. Sage advice because it's, it's, it's similar to, you know, any kind of emergency services role, isn't it? People and healthcare workers, people know their role. And so when it, when it is crisis mode, that's when everyone really kicks in and, and knows exactly what they need to do and, and how important their role is in it, whereas sometimes organisationally we've lost some of that. Mm. And, that, that kind of goes hand in hand in some ways, doesn't it? It does. And I think that's probably, again, an opportunity for the HR community to think about. And, and there's some really good examples uh, either in Australia or, or globally of, of individuals or leaders and how they've responded in a particular crisis to learn from. One of the books that I've read, which was, you know, the, the Qantas pilot who flying the A380 and, and he's talking about all of the alarms, you know, every single imaginable alarm going off in the aircraft and, and in the hysteria what they did is they just shut down the alarm systems um, and they just said, all right, let's deal through this on a fact-by-fact -fact basis. Let's just now check every single thing. Let's work through it, you know, in a chronological order to make relevant decisions because if we just responded to all of the alarms, one is our emotional state is heightened and, and two, we've got all of this noise going on in the cockpit. So if you take that outside of the airline industry and say in our own organisations, where do we develop these scenarios and test our leadership team, but not test our leadership team in a nice, comfortable way? 
Yeah, because that's not where you develop your experience and skills. It's it's developing a situation where they're put under pressure and the relevant emotions come to the fore. They've got colliding and competing demands and they've got to think through it. So I think that's a, it's a really, really good opportunity for our leadership teams as they think about the future. What do they do differently with the capability development component? Definitely an opportunity, absolutely. Russell, thank you so much and really appreciate your advice and your insights and, and best of luck getting through the rest of this. Thanks, Ange. Thank you very much. Take care.